Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, this is John Mooney, founding editor of NJ Spotlight News, and welcome to our second in a series of what we're calling Change Talks, uh, which are follow-ups to stories that we are doing, a, a series of stories we're doing on some of the big challenges facing New Jersey, and looking at some potential remedies, solutions, areas of, of progress, both uh, that are taking place in New Jersey, but also uh, elsewhere in other states and, and other communities. Um, we started a few weeks ago looking at maternal health and, and looking at some of the gaps uh, in, in terms of mortality and uh, any number of, of factors that go into maternal health. Um, and this follow is a, a, a switch to the budget process, which we are right in the middle of the state budget process. Uh, as everybody I'm sure on this call knows, um, Governor Murphy submitted a, a spending plan a few weeks back that is now before the legislature and there will be a considerable amount of uh, debate and discussion and testimony about what's in it and what's not in it. Um, our project really looked at how that budget is set, uh, the process that gets there. I know I know from the questions that folks submitted that there's a lot of uh, questions about what's in the budget, but we're really looking at how we got here and how budgets are set, uh, how this process of the next few months takes place, uh, steps that New Jersey takes in, in determining that and steps that New Jersey doesn't take. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to have a couple old friends uh, joining us today. Um, I'll lead off with with the man behind the the journalism and John Reitmeyer, uh, longtime reporter, uh, public finance and budget reporter for NJ Spotlight News. Uh, thrilled to have him here. John, thank you. Um, everyone should know that there's also a TTF vote going on today, uh, Transportation Trust Fund that he's not covering. Um, and uh, at least at the moment, he will yeah. be. Um, we will look he, for the story. He, he took he took a break uh, to join us today. Uh, so thanks, John. Um, I'm really thrilled to have you. We also have Brandon McCoy, uh, the new president and CEO of the Fund for New Jersey, uh, formerly of New Jersey Policy Perspective, an old friend of ours. Uh, I might add that Fund for New Jersey is uh, one of the uh, philanthropies behind uh, NJ Spotlight news, but uh, Brandon's expertise in finance uh, is undoubtable, and we were thrilled that he could join us to have this conversation as well. And then Chris Emmingholtz, and he and I uh, had this, uh, we, we reminisced a little last week about when we first met. Uh, Chris was at the Department of Ed when I was a, a reporter covering education, um, and now is uh, chief lobbyist. Can we call you? I think you have a fancy title. but That, that works. Uh, also worked with an outside group uh, that contributed mightily to John's reporting uh, on the budget process. Um, so let's get this going. Uh, for the folks out there, uh, you know, we you did a, a tremendous number of questions were submitted uh, during registration, and we continue to welcome folks to uh, put forward questions and comments, or even just introduce yourself in the chat, say hello from wherever you're coming from. Um, you're, you, we will keep an eye on that chat and, and hopefully can be able to in, integrate it into the conversation as well. But this is certainly meant to be engaging. Uh, we are also recording this. Uh, we will make that available on our site and in, through our newsletter. So please do share. Uh, we've had a great, great turnout of folks already. It's a, a you know our highest number yet, um, but we'd love it if you can share it with friends and colleagues as well going forward. This is not going to be the only writing, obviously, that John is doing on the budget process, nor is it, uh, it really is probably uh, the second of maybe a dozen different packages we're going to be doing around uh, the change project, too. So stay stay in touch and and stay tuned because there's lots more to come. But let me start with John Breitmeyer. Um, John, I, you know, came to our staff saying, OK, guys, let's let's look at some issues that we've all been focusing on and reporting on for years that have just sort of seemed intractable uh, and but have some potential solutions out there. Um, John, how'd you how'd you land on this one? And tell us a little bit how you got here and then we can delve into the report itself. 
Yes, sure. So I, I think, um, you know, the, the focus of the project is to look at social and economic challenges that New Jersey faces. And for me, uh, you know, you know, for better or worse, as a 20 year reporter covering state government, I've seen New Jersey go through the ups and downs of the revenue cycle. Uh, and when, when I looked at this idea of the budget process, which um, can seem a little esoteric and process in general kind of frustrates me that we often see journalism focus too much, I think, on process and not on substance. And yet, in this case, sometimes the process is what yields us uh, the, the substance that we may not uh, find best serves New Jersey residents. And so for me, uh, whittling down this topic into one thing that I could uh, take a look at specifically was this idea that when New Jersey sees its revenues plummet during an economic downturn, uh, we often see uh, programs that benefit everyday residents, uh, like property tax relief programs, or we see things like the, the, the annual contribution into the, the pension fund um, get ignored, or we, we see spending cuts in these areas. We don't see things like you know payments to bondholders. Uh, we don't we don't see any any uh, haircuts in that area. It's usually New Jersey residents who take it on the chin the most. Programs that New Jersey residents rely on. Uh, we've seen the subsidy to NJ Transit fluctuate. I mean, even today, the subsidy is still lower than it was pre-pandemic, and we and we see policy consequences come as a result of that. Um, and, and, and so the, the challenge was to look at, you know, what New Jersey does in terms of preparedness. How does New Jersey's uh, budget and budget process lend itself to getting ready for the types of uh, revenue losses that we see whenever there's a downturn, right? We, we can never predict when it's going to come, but we know uh, just over my the experience of my career, two big uh, declines occurred. The first one was during the and right after the 2007-2009 Great Recession. And then I just covered a few years ago, the big uh, revenue plummet that occurred in the wake of the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. And in both of those instances, one of the first hits was senior citizen property tax relief, property tax relief to low income homeowners. Um, if I go back to that, to the Great Recession, we had a property tax relief program that was uh, along the lines of, of what's being spent now. We had benefits for renters in a state where affordable housing is a huge challenge, uh, where we see um, racial disparities in terms of rates of home ownership. Um, and, and yet one of the first things that the, the plug was pulled on was uh, renter benefits, and they didn't come back until just recently. And so when we talk about uh, the process, again, that we can get kind of uh, uh, bogged down in the mundane, but if New Jersey is not ready for a recession, then we there are implications in, in the, for the lives of everyday New Jerseyans, and they often feel that pain more immediately, again, than something like, and, and no offense to anyone who, who buys a transportation trust fund bond or any other state bond, but they're, they're always made whole during these during this period of bumpiness. It's usually residents who take it on the chin. And so my the real focus of my reporting was to kind of write it from the perspective and report it from the perspective from the perspective of, of that resident, helping them understand why it's, it's actually a good thing for the state to improve its recession readiness. And so um, that can sometimes mean the surplus and how much money the state has put aside for a rainy day. But it can also mean, and this is where we got into the idea of the project, looking at what other states do. So there's there's a lot of good research it out doesn't, there. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, right. And we can see what other states have done, and it's well documented, to get through a state like North Carolina, which has a law on the books that links uh, rainy day savings to um, to to a um, target for, for stress. So their budget is stress tested. So they run actual models to say, okay, if we have revenue losses of, of this degree, uh, we need this much in savings, and then they can start to plan their savings to be able to kind of uh, be ready for the different degrees of, of recession that could come. And they got through a, a major hurricane and the pandemic, um, you know, in, in pretty good shape compared to maybe a place like New Jersey that had to do major spending cuts and borrow money um, with interest to keep the budget afloat, um, you know, which will be paying off uh, that principal and interest for, for quite a while still. And so um, 
Yeah, and, uh, again, and also looked at was a state like New Mexico, which uh, does long range assessments of both expenditures and revenues. And that's a state with pretty volatile energy taxes that they're heavily reliant on. And so if you have a good idea many years out of, the, of, of any um, misalignments that are on the horizon before you even get into a recessionary environment, I think the, the key is that you, you just would have policymakers have better information at their disposal, disposal to make decisions um, so we don't get into the situation that we're often in in New Jersey when it's like, Oh my, like the sky is falling. What are we going to do? And it's it's like there's there's no plan. Um, when there there are ways that other states and best practices that other states have followed to be a little bit better planned. Again, you can't predict when these things are going to happen. These types of major events, you can't say, okay, this next one is coming on X date. But you can, uh, uh, from a policy making perspective, um, you know, try to do all you can to to be ready for it. And that's what I looked at. Sort of what what does uh, New Jersey do currently as part of its process? And then looking at some things that are done in other places and some things that are being done in New Jersey. And there, and there was a, a notable reform uh, in recent months when it comes to sort of the, the, the budget uh, process and transparency related to the budget. So we can talk about that uh, in a little bit as well. But that's sort of the, the nuts you here. Inspiration yeah. for the, for the reporting um, and my contribution to this project, which last thing I want to say is is ongoing. I don't just like write this story and this issue's over. Um, we we do have a budget process playing out, and so I can evaluate this and 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 show sort of the strengths and weaknesses as we go forward, especially toward that June thirtieth deadline for for a new budget. Yeah, no, this is definitely an ongoing project with all of our our topics, and and this one especially because we're living it as it goes. Brandon, you uh, know a thing or two about what other states are doing. Uh, tell us a little bit about that background, but also, you know, being in New Jersey and being involved in these issues and then moving to the national scene and seeing how other states, you know, do you shake your head a little bit about your home state um, when you've had those conversations or you're like, oh, we're pretty progressive or is it somewhere in between? Yeah, not only am I shaking my head, but the people I'm talking to are shaking their heads, um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, for those who don't know, you know, I be I took this role of president of the Fund for New Jersey uh, January 2nd, uh, but the previous two years, uh, I was a vice president of state partnerships at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in D.C., and supporting a national network of public policy think tanks, of which the New Jersey policy perspective is one. And so I got to travel a lot. I was, you know, I was in Texas. I was in Illinois. I was in Hawaii. You know, I was, I was in a lot of places talking to a lot of folks doing uh, public policy work and you know, tax and budget work. Uh, and in all but one place when I would sort of recount some of um, my experiences doing uh, work in New Jersey, uh, folks would look at me like, you know, I had three heads and say, you know, how is that allowed? How is that process you know, uh, you know, considered okay. Uh, how's anybody put up with that? Um, the only place where I didn't get sort of uh, head scratches was uh, Ch Chicago and Illinois, which I'm not sure is the, is, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great signal. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think from what I've done over the past couple of years and from the people I've engaged and the things I've learned, um, the, there is one specific thing that really, uh, comes to mind when I think about New Jersey's budget process, which is a lot of other states, you know, the governor will introduce the budget uh, in, you know, late January, early February, something along those lines. And in New Jersey, the legislature doesn't introduce their budget until mid-June, usually at best, sometimes late June. Uh, in other states, you know, the legislature is introducing a budget and responding to the governor's proposal within two months. Uh, usually something is is introduced sometime in late March or April. Uh, and I think, you know, that might seem like a small detail, uh, but having the legislature respond to the governor with its own budget proposal allows the public to actually interrogate, uh, you know, important documents and to say, OK, well, here's what the, the governor's proposed and now here's what the legislature's proposed. And what do we think, you know, is a good, you know, maybe middle ground or what's what's the right answer on uh, you know these uh, these different programs and, and assets and investments, uh, New Jersey we don't have that opportunity. There is no opportunity to sort of si significantly and seriously 
interrogate the legislature's budget because it comes so late in the process uh, and it is passed so quickly uh, without much consideration for um, you know engagement from non-governmental officials or non-governmental experts. Uh, and as somebody who was well known for being a, a budget analyst and expert, you know, the budget would come out and people would say to me, what's in it? And I would say, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it was introduced five minutes ago and it was already passed through committee and it's 500 pages. And, and the legislature doesn't know. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah, we have lawmakers voting on who don't know either. But other states, you know, building into their process that the legislature, you know, uh, drafts and publishes a proposal of their own budget. In you know in uh, in April or so, I think that's really important because it gives the public a chance to, to really interrogate. Okay, what is it that our, our representatives uh, are seeking to do, and how can now when they're having hearings, you know, later on in the process, uh, they're actually doing it in an informed fashion. When we have hearings here, uh, it's sort of just like, well, here's what the governor said, and here's what we want. We don't know what you all want or what you all think is important. It's just sort of a weird. Uh, almost dog and pony show sometimes. And so, um, you know, personnel is policy, like people like to say, but process is policy too. And the process does not allow um, for, you know, folks who are not representatives or non-governmental officials to weigh in. And, you know, you have folks, John, Chris, others who are know a lot what's going on uh, and can actually help catch mistakes, can help uh, you know, raise issues that need to be caught rather than just continue to have this very uh, opaque and publicly hostile process uh, that we're just all supposed to put up with because that's the way it is. And we end up getting a lot of mistakes and we end up end up getting um, less than we deserve, I think. Somebody, think that, oh, sorry, John, do you think that lends itself to better outcomes or have you seen any evidence of that, Brandon? Because I think sometimes when we discuss these things, it's sort of like, well, it would be great to be more transparent. It would be great to have these built out discussions. But at the end of the day, we, we probably want to see better outcomes. And I think we can debate across the political divide what they are. But, you know, if we just, you know, for our own purposes, say to make New Jersey better overall, do you think a better process does yield better outcomes? I think at least over the long haul, it does. Um, you know, there's no silver bullet. I don't think any one, you know, process change would, you know, fix a whole lot, but like a suite of changes you know, if you were to have the legislature have to provide its own budget, plus multi-year projections and forecasts, you know, plus uh, requiring that bills and amendments are shared publicly, you know, two or three or four days ahead of, you know, the time before they're heard in committee. I think a lot of that can uh, have a significant impact on just improving the public's faith in government itself. Uh, and given where we are, you know, in this era uh, uh, in the country, um, it's, it's really... Um, dangerous and harmful to have these very opaque and insular processes because, you know, for everyone that lives in this state, you know, there's all this conversation about, well, we got to make it affordable, affordable for who, first of all, but also people are going to be paying uh, their taxes. They want to know that they're going towards the things that are going to make their lives easier. And when you have these rush processes that don't allow time for people to understand what's going on, that doesn't uh, generate much confidence or trust whatsoever. And I, I think that it's not taken as seriously as it should be. So, um, you know, obviously, if you go talk to folks in other states, they're going to say, oh, our budget process is terrible. Let me tell you how. I don't know if anyone does it well, but uh, I think we do it particularly poorly. And when you look at things like credit rating and whatnot, uh, we are we are still pretty far back in the pack. One thing I would say on that, and I agree with um, a lot of what Brandon has to say, is I think the more transparency we have, the more disclosure we have, the more voices that are at the table. I think leads to moderation and something that I know from the business community and my perspective on, on budget and tax issues over the years is I don't think we have moderation in New Jersey all the time. And I think if you have, and think about some of the recent discussions we've been having in New Jersey on transparency issues, whether it's on, on the line on Oprah, I think there are people from the further left and further right that are both calling for changes and so what might that mean is maybe the changes do bring people to the middle. And that's what I hope for. I think I think good policy comes from compromise in the middle. And I think the more transparency leads to more moderation, and hopefully takes New Jersey away from being an outlier, good or bad on, on either things and kind of brings in the middle. And you had the comptroller uh, testify, I think, last week saying, hey, uh, a government that's not transparent is likely a more expensive government. 
And so, you know, when you think about corruption and waste and fraud and abuse, and so these things are definitely tied together. There was a, one question from the chat. Um, to, to your point, Brandon, uh, are other states' legislatures full-time legislators, unlike in New Jersey, which would give them more time to introduce and, and deliberate over a budget? There are several that are, but there's several that aren't that still have, I would say, more robust processes than we do. Um, if folks want to really be wonky about it, I would suggest there's a report by the National Association of State Budget Officers, uh, aka NASBO. Uh, if you just Google that and uh, the budget is called Budget Processes in the States, and it breaks down each state's process in the calendar and sort of the various things that are you know the various features of each uh, state's budget process and who has multi-year forecasting and you know who um, you know which which legislatures introduce a budget alongside uh, the governor like it's it's very interesting to see there is no you know standard process here um, but it is very interesting to see the differences that exist and you know even a state like Texas you know they meet every two years because Texas is a big state it's hard to get everybody together and to to meet in Austin. Um, they, they, they're not a full time. They're only meeting for six months every two years. Um, but they're still able to, uh, you know, have some, I would say transparency on certain documents and proposals that we, we lack here. Wait, uh, think repeat that site again, that has that breakdown just so we can post it up if we can find the, it. The organization is a um, national association of state budget officers. Okay. Yep. And the, the oh, yeah, of course. Uh, reports called budget processes in the states. So John, talk a little bit about what, you know, some of the key areas you found that New Jersey isn't necessarily doing. We've talked a little bit about projections, um, but also stress testing, you know, give, give a, a quick synopsis of, of what your reporting found so far. Yeah, definitely. Um, when we look at like um, national best practices, and there are groups that regularly either rate states or look at what states are doing, like the Pew Charitable Trusts or the, the Volcker Alliance, nonpartisan groups that are looking at this, um, not for a specific uh, end goal, like a like a policy goal, but just they want states to be following good practices and, and maintaining um, you know, healthy um, financial practices as they do their budgets. And so um, you know, one of the reports I, I looked at for the story was recently done by the Pew Charitable Trust, and, and they looked at which states do long-range budget assessments. So more than just that one year in New Jersey, it seems to be always like this, this we, we have to get to June 30th with the current fiscal year budget balance, especially if there are unexpected shortfalls. Um, and then we have to enact a budget for the fiscal year that begins July 1, that's balanced at least on paper as of July 1. And so uh, New Jersey has that process that's very one one year to the next to the next and doesn't really take a big picture. You know, it may drive my wife crazy, but I sit down and map out, okay, my car payment is is this for the next few years. This is my mortgage payment. I think property taxes based on the trend are going to be going up this much. I know I have this um, frustrating um, basement um, project that I have to to fix because of the cracks in the basement floor, and I just sort of map things out, and this is where we're headed. So if we want to do this uh, for vacation, or you know, I try to plan so we don't get a, a big shock when when something comes up. And I think it's it's the same, although with many more zeros. Uh, oh uh, come on! Can't <laughs> imagine, can't imagine that basement for, is going to be expensive. For, you know, for states as well, and so. Um, you know, one of the things I looked at was this idea of doing long range assessments more than just that one year and, and what other places do it. Uh, again, I cited New Mexico, but if you go to the, the study that the Pew Charitable Trust did, which I, I, I linked to in my story, I, they have really nifty maps that show different states that do different policies and, and they're color coded and you'll see New Jersey is not in, in any of the colors because we don't do any of these things. And so um, maybe not surprisingly, right now we, we have a, a budget that's operating with a structural gap, which means the, the legislature and the governor are spending more money on an annual basis than the legislature and the governor are collecting through current uh, tax policies. And so uh, one way that the state overcomes that is there's a very robust budget surplus right now, uh, but that surplus only lasts for so long if you continue with this practice. And I think it's it's good we have Chris here 
because one of the things I looked at was in New Jersey in the last few years, a group uh, organized by Rowan University's Public Policy Center has begun to conduct the type of long range assessments uh, for the state budget that are done as a matter of routine in other states within government. In this case, it's happening without outside of government. However, it's really well informed because the people who are involved in the process, and, and Chris has been one of them, have a lot of good experience working within state government. And so they've, they, they're not just like sitting on the outside without, I mean, they don't have the latest tax collection figures from, from Treasury, um, but they, they, they know how the process works. They, they have a really uh, keen understanding of the big picture. And there are former state treasurers, former chief economists from Treasury. Uh, so people who have sort of been in the chair for these types of uh, exercises are now doing it uh, for the, the, the public policy center at Rowan. And for the last few years, have been putting out their projections on a regular basis to sort of inform the dialogue in New Jersey maybe a little bit different than what some other states do because it's not within the four corners of government, but they've been putting out uh, very detailed and I think credible uh, long range assessments. So really with, with, with Chris here with us, um, I'm curious to, to, from your perspective, how you think that's been going um, you know, since this exercise has begun, uh, how well you think these have been received and if, you're, if you think you're, you're um, having a, a, an effect on, on the discussions in New Jersey. I know from reporting that sometimes you do a big project and then does it have an impact or not? And for you guys, you put a lot of time and effort uh, into this exercise. So sort of you could just uh, put us behind the curtain a little bit on the, on the fiscal policy working group uh, in terms of, you know, how, how do you think it's been going and, and how, how it's been received in a state like New Jersey? No, thanks, John. And I, I think it does make a difference. It matters. And and thanks to Rowan and, and its Sweeney Center for Policy and, and Mark Magyar has been coordinating these efforts. Uh, we also worked um, in the legislature and was a reporter uh, back in the day for Spotlight. Um, for Spotlight work like, yes. like you guys do. So um, I think it matters to change the conversation and educate people. Um, and I think I, I know why I've been excited to work with the Sweeney Center is that Every time we could educate people on what the long long term revenues might be or the long range spending needs might be, I think you do add a degree of um, maybe a stability, a certainty, a predictability to the process. And if we have more legislators, more people in the executive branch, the public understands this and maybe demands that accountability, then I think we're better for it. Because the one thing I've consistently heard from my members at NJBA, we represent thousands of businesses all around the state from the uh, mom and pops on, on Main Street downtowns to the Fortune 500 that are household names, but all of them consistently tell us we want more predictability, we want more stability, we want to know what, okay, taxes in New Jersey are high, but we want to know what they're going to be and what they're going to stay at. Um, we want to know what our regulations are and what they're going to be and what they're going to stay at. They want to be able to plan. And I think the work of the, um, the Rowan work group I think leads to the ability to plan, whether that's planning for being able to afford a property tax initiative, being able to afford an investment in, in infrastructure or workforce, uh, whether it's being able to plan for a tax change down the road, whatever that planning is, it's hard to plan for something if we don't have the data behind it and know what, what our long-term both revenue and spending needs are gonna be. So I, I think they've propelled that conversation um, I still think it's early in its work where I, I can't say how many legislators are um, paying attention and going to the website and looking for their, their latest update. But I think it's it's starting to have that happen. And I think by good reporting by Spotlight and other folks that have followed it, um, I think makes a difference where if if something's getting reporting, getting attention, it will make its way into that that consciousness is uh, right now as as a business lobbyist. Uh, working on on these these budget issues, but I used to be a Senate staffer and the budget director for uh, for for one of the legislative branch, uh, one of the legislative offices, and and we looked to these things, and and we would take these things and then translate that into work that we eventually gave our legislators. So I think ultimately, if you're putting out good content, and I know this is, and it's reasoned and thoughtful, and and it backed with data and facts, and not something that's made up, as you said. I think that does start to make a difference. And hopefully, um, in addition to, you referenced the new piece of legislation um, for 
reporting that's going to happen on on our fiscal situation compared to other states. I think the more data is out there, um, this is a new new law that that actually there has to be reporting on where we stand vis-a-vis -vis other states um, that the legislature hasn't happened before. Because right now you get reporting from the state treasurer and you get a report from the the nonpartisan um, office of legislative services, and both of them come with facts. Neither one is lying, making things up. But I think the more voices you have and the more chances for um, legislators and the public to become educated on these issues, I think the better we are for it. Yeah, I was going to ask, I was going to just ask Brandon, because of your experience with other states as well, um, you know, whether whether change, I mean, this, this project is all about change, whether change does come with more information, um, you know, reaching the public, uh, you know, what you've seen other states shift to some of these practices, you know, what do they got that we don't? Um, or, or what do we not have yet? Um, you know, I, I'm curious on on what prompts them to actually start uh, reforming their processes. Uh, well, I, I think a few things come to mind are um, more. I think I think some they have some electoral processes that uh, yield greater power for the public, quite frankly, and then you have a greater incentive uh, for representatives and lawmakers in general to really tackle. The issues that are facing communities rather than the issues that might be of specific interest to them. And, you know, this is another topic that is in the news right now with regards to how our elections operate. Um, but also, you know, I think other states you see, um, you know, everybody knows that, you know, the governor of New Jersey is the most powerful governor in the country, you know, both because of the pocket veto, the line item veto, but also because the governor of New Jersey gets to appoint so many of the positions throughout state government. And in other states, uh, voters, you know, not, not every state, but many other states, voters have a chance to uh, vote for, you know, the AG or for, you know, a, a public uh, defender position or just various positions, positions throughout government, you know, various commissioners um, that can sometimes maybe be a bit of a team of rivals, so to speak, and, you know, try to really represent different interests and, and get things done rather uh, than be all uh, you know, having some political accountability to the governor specifically. So I think that process changes things. Um, and then also, I, you know, I would say, I would just offer up, uh, you know, I think towards the end of last year, um, this New Jersey State Planning Commission was uh, having some convenings to uh, develop or at least finalize a state plan. And we haven't had a state plan, I think, since 2010, 2011, maybe. It's been a long time. And so when you don't have a plan, then how can you make decisions about where you want things to go. Um, and so uh, there's there's various issues with regards to just like what is, you know, whether it's transportation, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, you name it, uh, what's the goal? What do communities need? Uh, what was what's gonna actually fix, you know, the problems that people are facing uh, in their lives? What's gonna make our state stronger and more resilient? Uh, because it's not just recessions, it's, you know, it's when does the next Sandy come? You know, when does another pandemic possibly happen? There's a variety of threats that exist. Uh, and as you know, um, as John said, just, you know, the focus seems to always be, let's just get to June 30th. Uh, that's not how life works. And that's not uh, how, um, you know, we should be operating our, our budget process. And, you know, obviously, this is all also influenced by what the federal government does, right, when the federal government is uh, being very active and uh, providing relief and resources to states, then that provides an opportunity for um, you know officials to take a step back and maybe reassess and uh, take advantage of those resources. And then when the federal government is not uh, providing a lot of resources to states, then that requires a different response. And so I'll just you know say the the leadership at the federal level has also been a bit volatile, uh, you know up up and down, changing hands uh, back and forth, and that can make things also more difficult for state leaders. Yeah, I uh, um, one, oh. go ahead, Chris. Oh, thank you, John. Um, I think just to reiterate um, Brandon's excellent point about the plan is, as thinking back to the process of the budget, is sometimes what happens without the plan and without a, a better, more transparent process is you have this last minute haphazard spending. And I think whether or not that spending is good or not, and I'm sure um, maybe some of the things that Brandon would think is good might not align up with what I think is good, but I think both of us would argue that if there's a formula to and prioritization to invest in something such as school aid, such as pensions, such as infrastructure, um, which I think many people would agree that those are good investments, 
they're done within a formula and the state has been building up and up and up how we invest in pension and school aid, for example, I think that's less haphazard. That's with a plan. While back um, late night in, in June um, in, in the state house, we found out that there was a billion dollars of new spending that wasn't per a plan, that wasn't from a formula. Um, and very rarely do you find out when that last minute spending happens, it's it's going towards something that was planned out months and months and months ago and the public is part of and the legislature is part of and advocacy groups are asking for. It's it's this haphazard nature of that spending. And when that haphazard nature of that spending is a billion dollars, and, and by the way, the, the business tax increase in the proposed budget is, is about that same billion dollars, um, it leads to poor outcomes. And what I'd much rather see that extra billion dollars have either not happened at all, or if it happened, maybe we put more into school aid, we put more into workforce development, we put more into investing in, in you had the maternal health care project earlier, you had um, a TTF is up today and, and putting people to work in transportation. There's so many things that could help people putting it into child care, putting it into um, innovation, making New Jersey an innovation capital of, of the country. All of those things would be well thought out things that need a plan that where money would make a difference. I think you'd be hard pressed to say, even though there's some good causes, that last minute spending back in June is going to put New Jersey like on the map as a leader in this or leader in that. That's where we should be. And that's where a plan comes. And that's where more transparency and some of the good work that, that John and Spotlight has done will help us get to help us get there. I mean, let me qu quickly stay on you. You're totally in John's wheelhouse with with the billion dollars extra because we've done a lot of reporting on that. But I just a question came to mind. Uh, Chris, because you're sitting with them, and John, you've interviewed former treasurers and the like. I mean, who are now espousing being more thoughtful and 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 thinking ahead and planning and all. You know, w where were they when they were a treasurer or legislators or the like um, when we weren't doing those kinds of things? Um, and you know, I mean, it's it's I, maybe a little easy to say it from the outside, <laughs> but I'm curious. I, you know, they yeah, were there on once. one hand, we want to give credit to people who are continuing to participate in our public dialogue and, and engage in these types of things when they could sail off into the sunset and collect a pension. So anytime somebody's, you know, volunteering their time to sort of make the process better and, and maybe it even makes them a more credible participant because sort of they've they've seen the, the ways it works. I, th I think the short answer, and Chris may have a different one, is when you're in that position, you're you're working for you're working for a governor and your job is to work for that governor or you're working for a legislature and your job is to work for that that you know uh, office legislative office that you work for and i'm glad chris brought up the office of legislative services because that's a nonpartisan group that does a lot of good work um, one of my uh, cheats that i always talk about when people ask me about something to do with the budget it's usually a, an, an ols uh, summary or a q a I mean, they do a lot of behind the scenes work during the budget process that illuminate a lot of what's going on if you can find it and want to find it. And, and uh, that's my job. So I, I'm often looking for it and finding it. But um, I, I think, you know, when we talk about people who've moved on uh, and then would be trying to be part of this this conversation, um, they probably have a much different perspective once once they're out of that role. Right. Right. And and sometimes they move into different uh, positions where, for better or worse, they're uh, still in the arena, but maybe just in another way. Um, so maybe they're representing some organization, um, you know, and, and then having a, a, a specific policy goal that might be far more narrow than when they were uh, in one of the higher level positions. But I'll let Chris take that on as well. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, John. Um, and great question, John. I, I think... Um, I think a reasonable person can ask that, but one, I would, I would give I would give more credit to these folks that I don't necessarily know a change happened, but they were working in a political system. And John said they worked for the governor, but like even just more bluntly than that, politics plays a role in all this. And and I think if we have rules and statute in place that makes it more transparent and and makes a more process. Maybe you depoliticize some of these decisions and and make it per a plan where there's a lot of voices at the table. If you don't do that and you have less transparency, then maybe a, a few voices could could take over and maybe 
political priorities do trump good policy. And and so I think the former treasurers, former staff that are part of this working group, we're, we're very lucky to have them and have, have them involved. And I think you'd be hard pressed to say um, any, there's any staff person's fault as to some of our, our shortcomings in the, these areas. Um, it's it's over the years, politics um, from some of the legislative leaders, some of the governors have have chosen to not not necessarily follow the more transparent processes. And and I think we'd be better, I think all of us, if that happened. But I, I, I don't think it's easy to blame one person, one treasurer, one staff person, one legislative office. I, I think it's been a kind of aggregation over the years of a lot of political decisions that aren't always in the best interest. Just to put a further point on that, I mean, you know, I want to say about four years ago, five years ago, maybe NJPP put out a report called the Notorious Nine. And it was the nine, you know, decisions that got New Jersey into its not so great fiscal position. And yeah, those are across various administrations of various political persuasions. And when I look at some of these things, you know, some of them are about, you know, pension changes or trying to make significant tax cuts without having ways to pay for them, making changes to retiree health benefits. But there were folks at the time, it's not like, you know, we did these things and it was like, oh, who knew that this was going to be a problem? <laughs> People at the time were saying these things were problems, right? So the politics, um, you know, it's it's so pernicious in a way and so challenging because uh, there does seem to be um, this insulation from uh, any concern about actually uh, being held accountable uh, to the decisions that are made at times. And, you know, sometimes you are able to break through and you see uh, there are, you know, something that is fast-tracked you know, gets enough attention, the Oprah bill, for instance, and you see it slow down because there's enough public attention. Uh, but generally over the past, you know, several decades in New Jersey, there has not been enough attention on what's going on in Trenton and things get fast tracked. And even though people will say, hey, this is not such a good idea from whatever perspective, fiscal perspective, or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, things happen for political reasons. And that is as much a part of this process as uh, sort of any uh, maybe more technical technocratic uh priority one of our one of our uh audience asked um do you think the population of new jersey has any idea of the of the budget um and how can we further educate them um and there was a recent poll actually um that our headline was uh less than half of new jersey's polled and i i think it was eagleton it may have been monmouth um knows anything about the budget and it was at 45 percent. and i'll admit i was like Really, forty five percent actually know something about the budget. I mean, that's actually pretty. I was I was pretty impressed with that uh, as a rate, but um, it made me think about the public process of of the budget. And as I think Brandon mentioned, the dog and pony show of people getting up there and speaking. Though I also have seen, and I can't think of them now, of course, because uh, you know on on the on the spot. But I have seen where there's been enough outcry at those hearings, but maybe it's also behind the scenes, where it has led to some changes in the budget. Um, and you know, it's a great point, John. You're hearing it now to a degree with the school funding, uh, where actually all the noise is coming from the hundred districts that aren't getting increases, as opposed to the three hundred that are. And I'm and we're already seeing bills that are going to make up for that. But but John, you covered. You know, you cover these hearings and I'm like, uh, and to the point of Brandon, where sometimes you think, you know, they're just whistling in the wind. But other times, you know, you see an issue rise, rise up. Uh, I, and maybe you can think of one. I can't. No, uh, for sure. And, and I texted you with a little bit of a dismay that we were only at 45 percent. I've been trying, you know, at Spotlight for going on 10 years almost to, to you know, ev evangelize or at least try to boost public understanding and engagement, right? Like my job isn't to make New Jersey do a certain policy when it comes to, to fiscal policy, but it is to hopefully get people aware and engaged and interacting with their lawmakers and pushing for what they want to do. Um, and so, um, yeah, the budget hearings that are, you know, we have two this week, public budget hearings, uh, while they often are rote and it's uh, uh, often, um, you could probably guess the testimony for some of those who are who are speaking before they even start talking, and 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 in New Jersey's version of it, it's limited to three. You get three minutes of you have to get your money's worth when you testify <laughs> during one of these public hearings. You have three minutes, uh, as Chris knows, 
uh, to, to, to speak your piece. But I, I have seen, and I've been covering these budget hearings for a long time, and it's easy to get cynical or jaded, but the first evidence really of the depths of the opioid epidemic, I, I was starting to see at budget hearings. And you would have parents coming and just telling their very uh, heartening stories about um, problems that their, their children were, which, you know, their young adult um, uh, children were having with uh, heroin. And it was hard to hear and it was hard to, to listen to and not have a heart to that. And it was hard for lawmakers to not respond. You know, the debate almost 10 years ago over school funding was different than what we're seeing today, where we're seeing districts who were considered several years ago to be, quote, overfunded. Um, we were seeing districts who were, by the definition of the school funding formula, considered underfunded uh, and because of different uh, ways that the formula was being a little manipulated um, were not getting what, by the math, they would be um, entitled to under the school funding formula. And, and there you could, you could again, you, you watch a parent trying to get more aid to their school. Um, and, it, and for a lawmaker, you know, that you see six, seven, 10, 12 uh, people come up, again, not from some group, literally a parent from a town saying, I live on uh, at Adams Street and my child goes to this school district and, and we just had the, the band program cut or something like that. And so um, I do see lawmakers. Another example is the, the child care. Uh, what, what we've uh, been referring also often to since the pandemic is the child care crisis. I mean, you've seen New Jersey create a whole new tax credit out of whole cloth. Um, for for um, parents for child care costs, and you've seen other legislation come through. These were issues that have been kind of bubbling up in, in budget hearings. And without taking the, the rest of the time here, we have a lot going on right now, um, big picture, and I think it's been referred to, whether we're talking about access to public records, how we vote in New Jersey. Uh, a lot of times it takes engagement to bring about the, to get the attention of lawmakers. And I, people always ask me, well, well, I'm upset about this. What should I do? And it's it's pretty simple. It's, it's a call or write a letter to your representative. Show up at a hearing if you can. And I know that's not always easy because they're often during the daytime. Uh, and, and put in a slip to, to, to testify um, and, and be there. I mean, look at the crowds that have come out in, in recent days for different pieces of legislation that have seemed to touch a nerve. Um, you know, that... One, it takes a long time for those hearings to, to occur than maybe they originally scheduled. Um, but it also shows there's a sort of critical mass in favor of uh, a certain policy that maybe uh, lawmakers can be blind to if they, they stick in their bubbles. Um, the, the one thing I, I, I wanted to bring up when we talk about some of these budget processes is the concern about politicizing them. Um, and I know that's something that I've talked to some people about where you have uh, something done like by o OLS, the Office of Legislation, uh, Legislative Services, which is nonpartisan, but it can get taken into the political re arena and sort of distorted by those who aren't really truly trying to get New Jersey to a better place fiscally, but are really just trying to maybe win that next election. Um, you know, what What are the ways that, I mean, I, I guess, should we accept that that's always going to be the case, that you're going to have some something de demagogued or taken out of context, uh, or, or what can be done to sort of protect uh, sort of fiscal policy from, you know, somebody cherry picking a number. I mean, we see it often uh, where a number will be cherry picked or somebody will, will um, find causation where, uh, you know, just because two, two different da data points show up on the same page. Um, how do how do we how do we protect against you know from your guys' experience um, some of those things from happening or do we just have to throw up our hands and say it's gonna it's gonna happen and we uh, we just have to adjust and and react when it does? Well, I think um, politics is deserves some of the blame for some of the imperfections in the system, but I also think um, we're talking about the flawed system, but there's also some some positives, and, and I think the the public hearing process um, does present an opportunity to to regular New Jerseyans and advocates from all different um, perspectives to have a chance to be heard. And I think that's led the politics of that has led to some good policy outcomes, whether the politics are these parents that that had these truly awful, awful stories about 
the need for more mental health support and addiction support services and parents that came out from the underfunded districts. And and you think back to like one of our newest assemblywoman, Andrea Katz from Burlington County, um, led a, a grassroots coalition of people from underfunded school districts a long time ago when this was first bubbling up and that 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 grassroots effort became it got the ear of many legislators on both sides of the aisle and ultimately became S2. And now the S2 funding has led to other districts and other people complaining now. But I think that grassroots component legislators saw politically, you know what? These parents are are, are they're they're making good points. They're they're saying something that's going to resonate, that's going to get press attention. Maybe I should pay attention. And and having those hearings, if we didn't have that openness and that ability to to interact with legislators the way we do, and I was there at those hearings staffing the Senate committee where that resonated with people or some of the issues of, of how we support the developmental disability community in New Jersey, that resonated with people. Right now, um, I think the, the first assembly hearing last week, the, um, the county colleges did a great job of resonating with people at their hearing. So I think there is sometimes good causes that are politically the right thing to do and policy-wise the right thing to do that take these public hearings and and use them as the way they should and get their, their issue on the radar when otherwise it might not be. So I, I think there is some value. We're not all um, opaque and behind the scenes. And, and I think the public process, and I would say Chairman Sarlo and Chairman Pintamarin do a good job at allowing these things to kind of elevate and get, get uh, we need to improve, but but getting some of the things on the table that otherwise might not be. Yeah, Brandon, I, would, I generally agree, though. I, I do think there is a challenge of who is offered the opportunity to be heard. And there are definitely, um, you know, when you when you think about some of the, uh, you know, there's a question in the chat about, you know, New Jersey's budget size and you know, per capita in the chat says about 5,000. What I can see online says is about 6,000 per capita. And how's that compared to other states? We're number 26 in the country when it comes to per capita budget spending. But I think most people, if you were to ask them, how are we per capita, they would probably assume we're top five or top 10 because they hear spending, spending, spending. You know, similarly, when it came to uh, the census, there was this huge assumption, hey, the state's losing population. Nobody wants to be here. Everybody's fleeing. We added 500,000 people. You know, we, it was thought, it was assumed that we were going to lose the congressional seat, and we didn't. And we added 500,000 people, and that has major impact on federal resources. And so there's sometimes there's just this um, conventional wisdom about New Jersey that I think is really steeped in uh, what I would consider to be a dated perspective of the state. Um, and I think it's also a little bit due to who gets heard. And there have been many times where, you know, at least I personally have seen people who uh, take a day off of work to come down to Trenton to testify, submit their slip, and the chairman of the committee does not call on them because they don't feel like hearing from that perspective at that point in time. They they assume they know what they're going to hear, um, or you know the the committee doesn't start on time; it starts an hour late. Mm -hmm. And so you know there are certain you know folks who can deal with that um, because they have enough um, you know they they either, they either have the means or the flexibility in their schedule or the type of job that allows them. Uh, to you know, deal and put up with that, but a whole lot of folks don't. And uh, you know, I I think there's a tremendous need to be more thoughtful about, uh, you know, given how diverse this state is. Uh, you know, no no shade to Nebraska, but this is ain't, this is not Nebraska. Uh, this is a very diverse state with a whole lot of different communities, and that's that makes that helps make this state stronger and better. But only when everybody has the opportunity to be heard. And it, I do feel like over time, it's, you know, it is getting better, but still there is a certain privilege for uh, those who have greater means uh, and, and communities that have, by extension, greater political power. Do you think, um, and, and anyone can really answer this, that we'd be better served, we have public hearings at the beginning of the process, like we're playing out this week, uh, as we've talked about, a lot of changes get made at the very end of the process. Um, it's good to talk about things at the beginning, for sure, but do you think there should be a, a bigger effort? And I think your points are, are really well made, Brandon, in terms of participation. Um, and, and let's say that we want to do a better job of, of reaching out and getting all of the voices heard that deserve to be heard. But should we have public hearings at the end of the process as well? Um, 
when a lot of the changes are made. Uh, and uh, maybe they're not major changes in terms of volume. Maybe most of the budget stayed the same, but they're big changes in terms of impact. I think it would be nice to be able to do so. I mean, obviously, when the legislature budget gets submitted, you know, June 18th, there's not a lot of time uh, to be able to have that sort of reflective opportunity. Um, but as much as you can build in any engagement with the public to both hear and explain and clarify and communicate in general, I think that's all for the better. Uh, and, you know, easier said than done. Of course, we have 565 towns, we have 600 plus school districts, you know, for how much everybody says, you know, they hate government in Jersey. I think we love our system of government. We got a whole lot of it. Um, but, you know, at least showing effort and trying to find ways to better ensure that the public is understanding what is going on uh, when it comes to how the state and how representatives are investing in the various things that this uh, that are going to determine you know their lives. I think that's crucial, and you know we all know it, and you all do a wonderful job. You have many journalists in the state who do a tremendous job, but still, at the end of the day, if you're in North Jersey, a lot of your attention is attuned to New York. If you're in South Jersey, a lot of your attention is to, attuned to Philadelphia. New Jersey is very rarely the leading story on the six o'clock news, no matter where you are. Uh, I live in Central Jersey, and so I'm I'm watching NJ Spotlight News on YouTube every night. Thank you for doing that; it's great. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of folks are just turn on CBS two, and then you know, going from there. And uh, how how do we do a really uh, intentional job of really putting this information in front of people's faces and saying, "Hey, this is going to impact your kids' ability to get to school. It's going to impact your ability to get to work. This is going to impact how much it's going to cost you to keep a roof over your head." Uh, it's that is definitely a, a difference that I see based on where my experience of other states. It's just the awareness of what's going on in our backyard here is way uh, weaker than uh, I've seen in other places. Quickly, John, we only have a couple of minutes left, but uh, there are a couple of bills that would at least add some some transparency or the like in terms of our process. Are there not, or? Uh, we, yeah, we have, there are, have been some bills introduced. Uh, you know, so a lot of times we see these bills come up from session to session. There is a stress testing bill. Um, and I did want to come back to, there was a change made uh, in recent months that, that does require the state's annual financial report, uh, which is a great document in terms of um, fiscal transparency, if you know how to read it to be produced in a plain language version. Um, and Chris's organization uh, was in support of getting that to the finish line. Um, and the CPA Society deserves a lot of credit for that idea and BIA was happy to work with them. Yeah, so I mean, there there, there have been some changes already uh, in terms of in this area. And, and we could probably argue whether more should be done. And, and there are proposals out there as we speak. So again, if anyone who um, thank you for, for for sticking with us the whole time uh, is engaged on this topic and, and wants to, to 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 push this, you know, reach out to your lawmaker and say you'd you'd like, like them to um, take a look at, at some of these proposals. They are out there in real time. If if if, um, if somebody agrees with that and and wants to uh, get in touch with their representative, I mean, this could be an ongoing discussion if if um, more people uh, said this is what we want to have happen in New Jersey for sure. Well, this is going to be an ongoing discussion because of thanks to John Reitmeyer and, and Chris and, and Brandon who are bringing it to the fore. Um, we unfortunately uh, need to close, but I want to thank uh, very much. This is also a, one that we're going to be coming back to. As mentioned, John is going to continue to cover this uh, this process leading up to hopefully not uh, June 30th. Uh, we've spent a couple of uh, late Junes um, over the years and you know, let's let's hope we're not getting into that situation again, but um, I really appreciate it. I know there was a lot of comments um, and questions in the chat that we couldn't get to. Um, certainly feel free to reach out to John or myself through email. It's basically last name, first initial at njspotlightnews.org. Um, and you know, share your thoughts. Uh, some really uh, interesting things said, and and you know, I our hope in this project is to at least get these conversations going towards the prospect of change. It doesn't just change for the sake of change isn't the answer, but certainly the, there's lots of good ideas that 
that can be contributing to this conversation. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, it's really been a, a great session. Um, and thank you very much, Chris and Brandon, for joining us. Uh, when we do it again, we may bring you back uh, for the sequel. But um, thanks, everybody. We're going to sign off, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Take care.